Welcome to the Present History Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Just a little bit of a warning before this video podcast episode gets underway. We had a few technical difficulties with the sound, with the microphone and the recording. So my part, my questions do sound a little bit off. I have since re-recorded all my questions for the audio podcast. So if you want to hear my voice in much higher quality, (laughs) you can go check it out on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. But Annie's parts, Annie's answers, they are all just the same quality, just as perfect as they would be in the audio. So that's the main thing anyway. So please do enjoy this episode of the Present History Podcast, and please accept our deepest apologies for some sound trouble. Welcome to the Present History Podcast. We have a very special episode today as we are with Annie Whitehead, an Anglo-Saxon historian and critically acclaimed author. Uh, Annie, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure and an honour to have you on the podcast, so thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. So would you mind telling us a a little bit about yourself, uh, your background, what made you get into history? Right, so... um about myself so I moved around an awful lot as a child my dad was in the army and my mum was a teacher but she was also very very interested in history herself although that wasn't her subject so I kind of grew up with visiting different places different countries absorbing different cultures and wherever we went and even when we went on family holidays there were always historical sites to visit my mum was great um, with sort of talking me through the, the very basic history. I was quite young. And then we spent six months living in York. And I was really lucky I didn't go to school because it was deemed not worth unsettling me just for six months. And just what a place to be homeschooled. I mean, I say homeschooled. I was rarely at home because York had every. They didn't have the Jorvik Museum back in those days. Uh, but the Castle Museum and Clifford's Tower and just and I just really soaked it in. Come A level time, I actually wanted to do English. That that was that was my thing. I was going to go to university and I was going to do English. Um, and then the history kind of started taking over, and I realised that it's still stories, and that's what attracts me about history. It's the stories. So, and I actually got a better result in my history A level than I did my English. um, (laughs) And that kind of decided me. So um, off I went to do a history degree and it was the most incredible history curriculum. That was such a wide choice. And I just found that gradually over the course, I was just gravitating more and more towards uh, the pre-conquest history. And it just really appeals to me because, I say it's it's stories. I think that's that's what it is all the time. It's it's stories. And I did my degree and then kind of sort of thought about the, the English side of things again and that I wanted to write and got a job working in publishing for a short while and then family, raising a family kind of took over um, and all that had to take a bit of a back seat. And then when I found the time again, I just got back into researching. Um, and writing and the more I wanted to write the more I wanted to research and so that's that's where I've got to where I am now really. That's amazing that's amazing it's always interesting to me to hear different people's experiences and stories of how they got into history as well it's it's always fascinating so your book uh, Mercia the rise and fall of a kingdom tells the story of the Mercians, the kings, queens, saints, sinners, earls and warrior women that governed the kingdom and shaped its history. Could you, uh, if it's possible, (laughs) uh, give a a brief outline of the the kingdom of Mercia and its history? Yeah, it's, um, I I think it's slightly different from the other, um, I know it's a problem, but I'll I'll say for sake of argument, we'll use the term Anglo-Saxon. Um, it's um, it's even different in its name because it's Mercia Mutna. It, it, it means the march or the border people, but we're not even quite sure what border is being referred to. 
Um, it's usually assumed that that refers to the border with Wales, but it could equally have meant the border with Northumbria. So they're already a little bit mysterious. Uh, we're not quite sure where they came from. They were probably Angles rather than Saxons. And they seem to have initially a very small um, base, um, sort of either side of the River Trent. Um, that's what Bede tells us. And they gradually, just like the other kingdoms, I suppose, built themselves up either through conquest or just absorbing the smaller British kingdoms. But they still remained a little bit more of a federation. And then they got bigger and bigger under various really successful uh, warrior kings. I mean, Pender was the first one that we really hear about. Um, and then getting bigger and bigger and more successful. And probably the Zenith came with King Offa, which I think most people have heard of King Offa. If they haven't heard of him, they've heard of his, his dyke. And then it all started to go a little bit wrong because in this period, fathers very rarely su uh, were succeeded by sons. There were lots of different contenders for the throne. I think partly because of that history of it being a federation, there were lots of tribal leaders or erstwhile tribal leaders. And they sort of, there was a, a triple hit really because they kind of ran out of kings and the Vikings started appearing. And there was a king of Wessex called Edgbert, who's not particularly well known or very famous, but he established the dynasty that produced Alfred the Great. And Wessex then, the, the kingdom of the West Saxons became sort of preeminent. Um, and Mercia took a bit of a, a downward slide. It still had its moments. It had Athelflaed, Lady of the Mercians. And then afterwards it became not a kingdom, but an earldom. And in its sort of uh, dying stages, uh, it was ruled over by a really successful and influential family. And um, then the last Earl uh, died in 1071 and it now only exists really as, as a memory in, it's still used, uh, the local police force is the West Mercia police force, but it's, you know, at, at its height, it included pretty much all of England south of the Humber. So oh, wow. it, it was huge and it was powerful, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And through, throughout your book, um, you mention a, a number of different sources. Um, what do sources for this period usually look like? How trustworthy can we kind of see them to be? Yeah, we there's, a, there's quite a lot of contemporary material, actually, for all it's known as the Dark Ages. And the contemporary sources we've got for the, the various periods, I mean, it's a long period. It's like from now back to the Tudors, the Anglo-Saxon period. So it, it was a long time. Um, we've got the likes of Bede, who was reasonably contemporary. Um, we've got um, um, King Alfred's biography written by Asser, the monk who lived with Alfred at the time. So there's, there's a few contemporary sources. We've got the law codes, we've got charters, we've got personal wills. So all these are useful. The trouble with them being contemporary, oh, there's also for the later period, um, a, quite a unique um, layman's chronicle, Athelwyd the Chronicler, who wasn't uh, a monk, he was actually a nobleman. So that gives us a really useful um, insight. Um, but with all these contemporary sources, it's great that we got them, but that doesn't mean they're without bias. And there's the problem. So you've got Bede, who's a Northumbrian and a monk. So he's very pro-Christianity, obviously. He's very pro-Northumbrian, obviously. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which for the later period is contemporary, is fabulous, um, but it's also was commissioned by the West Saxons. So it's got quite a, a strong West Saxon bias. So you have to take that into account, but also knowing that bias can be really useful. So Bede, who was very anti-Mercy and very anti-King Pender, does compliment him from time to time. So you think, well, okay, I can take that seriously because this is someone who doesn't like him, but he's still saying something nice about him. Yeah. So the contemporary sources are great. They're actually, they're not brilliantly uh, abundant for Mercia, unfortunately. Um, we have very little that comes direct from Mercia. We've got the Anglo-Norman chroniclers as well. Um, they're useful because a lot of times we think they are using 
uh, earlier sources which are now lost to us. So that's an important um, record. But they tend to be the ones that embellish everything. And um, we get the, the lurid stories of poison and witchcraft and murder. And they seem particularly fond of telling us stories about the murder of tiny children. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they really they really go for it. Wow. <laughs> um, but um, again, they are useful because uh, particularly uh, Red, uh, Roger of Wendover, um, seems to have been writing from an earlier source that we no longer have and a lot of times we get information from him and detail that that isn't available anywhere else so you have to sort of throw them all together and then you know sift through what we've got and uh, compared with later periods there isn't a lot but there is perhaps more than people might imagine yeah yeah because something you touched on there was that it's often known as the dark ages and there's this kind of myth that the Saxons were very uh, illiterate or uneducated or uncultured. Um, your book suggests that that was actually kind of the opposite in, in reality. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, they, they were certainly literate and not just the monks. Um, we've got lots of evidence, actually, that a lot of the women were literate. I mean, there's a, a, a story that Asa... Uh, King Alfred's biographer gives us that it was Alfred's mother who taught him and his siblings to read. So she, uh, she must have, she gave them a little test, you know, that the first one who could learn a poem, um, I can't remember the exact details, but it's clear that, that she must have known how to read if she was testing them. Um, we know that Queen Bertha of Kent, uh, 7th century, we know she was literate because a contemporary source tells us that she was. Um, so we've got lots of I mean, the abbesses and the abbots of the huge monasteries, they must have been able to read because they were basically estate managers. You know, they had to have known what was going on in, in the, the land grants and the documents. Uh, reading and writing, of course, two separate skills. So those, uh, you know, the, the nobility who might have been able to read wouldn't necessarily have needed to bother to learn how to write um, but you know we talk about culture when you look at some of the illuminated manuscripts that were being written that were being produced um, they're absolutely beautiful you know these were skilled calligraphers and then if you uh, look at the likes of the Sutton Hoo treasure or the Staffordshire hoard the craftsmanship, working those jewels, working the gold filigree, um, even modern jewelers aren't quite sure how they did it without the modern tools, um, you know, polishing the garnets, um, just incredible levels of skill. Um, also, the society was, I know they seem to be at war most of the time, <laughs> and, and that's, that's pretty true, but mm. it was quite an ordered society to the point where actually I mean William the Conqueror didn't initially change very much of the administrative systems because they worked so well but you have this really ordered society based on uh, mutual bonds and mutual obligations so even the word lord uh, comes to us from old English and it actually means loaf giver so the, uh, the idea is that the lord literally feeds his people you know, he's, he's responsible for them. Um, so there's that. There's even evidence uh, that they used um, tablecloths and napkins. So, you know, and, and there were rules about, you know, um, table manners. <laughs> so, so they're not, not, not quite the, you know, the, uh, the uncultured oafs that, you know, they, they might sometimes appear. The, the halls as well were very highly decorated. So you, you tend to often see these sort of, Yes, they were wooden buildings in the main because that, that was what they liked to use to build their houses. Um, but they weren't just bare wood inside. So you'd have uh, intricate wooden carvings and beautifully uh, embroidered wall hangings. So yeah, I think people perhaps get a false impression that they were skilled at the crafts, they were reasonably civilized um you know perhaps not compared with with later standards but perhaps surprisingly so i think yeah yeah no because there's this common idea that you had the romans who were the epitome of civilization and then once they left it kind of 
all went downhill into the pit of barbarism. Um, but that doesn't seem to necessarily be too accurate. I t- well, I, I think possibly um, when the Romans left, but I mean, that's, that's all being assessed now, that the period straight after the Romans left. Um, but yeah, they were... Obviously, they brought a different culture over. Um, there's some thinking that they certainly initially avoided the old Roman towns. Um, again, there's some debate about that going on now. Um, so yes, they brought a different culture. They like to build in wood rather than stone. But again, we tend to think of that as being, you know, not, not very comfortable, perhaps, not very um, elaborate, but... Um, I was uh, researching a little while ago about sounds and noises and um, what's interesting is that when you live in a a sort of communal situation and obviously they did in their their great halls, in stone buildings sound echoes, it reverberates. So if you're in a crowded hall and you want to have a private conversation, a wooden building is much more conducive to that because the sound stays where you want it to. So, you know, there's, there's lots of different aspects to living and we shouldn't just think about them, you know, living in, you know, Watland or huts. There, there was, it, it was a, a choice, I think, rather than not having the skills or the technology to live another way. That's the way they chose to live. And of course the hearth was the home and it was really important. And, and the worst thing really that could happen to you would be to be banished, to be exiled. And you've got these wonderful poems that fortunately still exist that, that tell of the, the wanderer's lament, you know, the, the exile who's banished and will never see his home and his hearth again. So that's all really important. It's, it's part of their lifestyle, their culture, this communal living. Wow. wow. And so would you say that that kind of communal living, the potentially family aspect that homely aspect was was fundamental to anglo-saxon culture i think it was um we have a poem that's written um, from the point of view of parents who brought up their child and it talks about how the parents do their absolute best for the baby i mean obviously infant mortality rates very high and not just for the the lower classes i mean alfred lost a number of children Um, we've got evidence that king edwin of northumbria lost a few children so you know royalty wasn't immune to infant death but um, this poem talks about how the parents give their their all really into raising the child keeping the child alive and then into adulthood and then the sadness that the child then goes out into the world and has to make its own way and the parents are then helpless and it's it's such a a modern emotion really we can really empathize with with that you know that feeling that situation so yeah I think family was very important there's there's evidence that babies particularly were very well cared for there was um, an exhumation where a baby had been born with a cleft palate and had been buried with a feeding bottle. So clearly someone had tried to help this baby to survive, even though it had been born with this, this difficulty in feeding. Wow, wow, no, it's, it's fascinating, it's fascinating. Um, how large of an impact do you think that Christianity had on the Anglo-Saxon culture, but then on the Kingdom of Mercia in particular? I think it changed a lot. Um, I think it was, initially a very gradual process and often quite cynical. The the kings uh, were converting because it suited them. Um, I mean, that's the very cynical comment of mine, I appreciate. (laughs) Um, Some of them were very, very devout. A lot of kings abdicated, um, became monks. Uh, So did a lot of the nobility, a lot went on pilgrimage. But there was a lot of cynical political manoeuvring as well. Um, you know, um, convert and I'll I'll be your overlord and I'll protect you was one aspect. Or convert and uh, you know we can go into an alliance and uh, hey, would you like to marry my daughter as well while you're at it? Lots of that going on. In Mercia, of course, slightly different because 
One of the reasons that Bede, I mentioned earlier, was really not a fan of King Pender of Mercia was because Pender was resolutely pagan. Yet he never converted, um, all of his children did. And one of the compliments that Bede pays Pender is that he, although he was uh, a filthy pagan himself, he actually allowed missionaries essentially to come into his lands and to preach the word. So he was quite religiously tolerant and we've got one of his basically one of his enemies telling us that so I you know I'm inclined to believe it so he was quite happy for other people to convert if they wanted to but he wasn't going to so I think that the process of mercy took slightly longer um, and it's to a certain extent because the, the mercies were always a little bit out on their own there was a slight difference in that obviously they didn't have Canterbury which was the seat of uh, Christianity in, in the English kingdoms. And Offa, bless him, not much to like about Offa, but you have to admire his uh, ambition. He wanted his son um, to be anointed in his own lifetime. Because um, as I mentioned, you know, sons and fathers rarely succeeded each other. And he wanted to make sure that this happened. And to that end, he decided to establish his own rival archbishopric in Lichfield, which didn't go down particularly well in Canterbury. So I think there were always aspirations there to, to, to build up the Mercian uh, church. So um, it's also interesting that in the early days, it's not mentioned by Bede because it's not in his interest to, but there is a school of thought that says a lot of the Mercians were actually converted uh, by British rather than Roman clergy. So in Kent and in Northumbria, it tends to be um, the Roman missionaries who are, are coming and, and doing the baptism. Bede seems to give the impression that the same was happening in Mercia. We think that probably wasn't the case. So again, there might have been a little bit of a difference. I mean, in Northumbria, famously, there was the, the Synod of Whitby where they had to decide once and for all whether they were going to stick with the British church, or, you know, the, the sort of Irish tradition, if you like, or the Romans. But I think possibly there was a little bit of that going on in Mercia as well. But I think essentially, although they came to it a bit later, and I think perhaps slightly less cynically in some cases, um, but then started to try to overreach and, and almost establish a, a, a rival set up with the the archbishop in Lichfield, which didn't last long. They got into a lot of trouble actually with Canterbury, a lot of the, the Mercian kings and a lot of the powerful abbesses had legal tussles um, trying to establish ownership of the, the large abbeys, which again might have been more of a, a financial issue than anything else because you know these, these abbeys were really lucrative but yeah, they, they locked horns with Canterbury on a number of occasions, the Mercians. Wow. Wow, it's fascinating. Was there was there a large saint culture, in inverted commas, uh, in Mercia? <laughs> and again, I think probably no more or less than in the other kingdoms. Um, there are, there's a plethora of Anglo-Saxon saints, and I think they're not always traditionally canonized so a lot of them perhaps not necessarily recognized by the, the Roman Catholic Church but um, yeah a lot of, of saints and what is I find fascinating uh, is that this you know awful pagan pender his entire family virtually was uh, you know they were either saints or they were venerated in in some shape or form so his youngest son Athelred who was a very successful king he was one of those who abdicated uh, in favour of his nephew and, and went off to become a monk. He and his wife were venerated at Bardney uh, in Lincolnshire, which is where they were both buried. Um, Pender's daughters were all venerated as saints. Um, there's, um, I mentioned earlier the Anglo-Norman chroniclers and, and their um, delight really are the stories about little little children who were murdered there is a story um, I don't believe a word of it but there is a story that a wolf Hera, uh, another of Pender's sons had two small boys who were being brought up as Christians and wolf Hera didn't like this and uh, in a rage he murdered them 
th this comes from a much later chronicle and there's precious little evidence. I mean, Wolf Harry himself was a Christian, so it makes no sense. But if you add these stories in, there was a, also another little child who was supposed to be a grandson of Penders, although the links don't work. Um, but if you include him, he was uh, born able to speak, predicted his own death, uh, died when he was an infant. He became a saint, Saint Romwald. Um, add all these stories into what we know about Penders' children and grandchildren. There's about 14 or 15 saints in those, you know, just the, the two subse uh, subsequent generations from Pender. So, yeah, um, one of the more famous ones, probably St. Werbra, who was Pender's granddaughter, and um, she was venerated particularly at Chester, and Athelflaed Lady of the Mercians did a lot to promote her saintly cult at Chester. So she's probably one of the, the better known ones. But uh, yeah, all sorts, St. Edith of Polesworth, who we think was probably the same um, Edith, sister of King Athelstan, who was married to a, a very short while to um, Citric, King of, of um, Dublin and then King of York. She was also venerated as a saint at Polesworth. So there were a few, but again, if, if you look at the other kingdoms, you'll find just as many. So I don't think they were unusual, but I say just what is unusual is how quickly we went from Penda the Pagan to a whole family of children and grandchildren who were all venerated. Wow, wow, that's incredible. Um, with the, as, as time went on and with the formation of a, the new idea of a united England, the, the power of Mercia seems to start to fade. Um, what was the state of Mercia by 1066? Yeah, it, it had faded. It had become an earldom, um, initially an earldom, and then the, 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 the earldom became earls. Um, in the 10th century, they were still pretty powerful. Um, there was one earl, Alvara, who was named as one of the three leading earls of the kingdom. So it, it, was, it was still a, you know, a, a good job to have. Uh, by 1066, it had been governed by an incredibly powerful Mercian noble family. And this family included uh, Lady Godiva. It included Elfiever of Northampton, who was Canute's, uh, some say concubine, some say wife. Um, it also included the, the last earls, Edward and Morcar, and their sister, uh, Algith, who was actually um, unique in that she was Queen of Wales and then very, very briefly Queen of England because she was married to Harold Godwinson. So they were, yeah. Um, so Edwin and Morcar's grandfather was Earl Leofric, who was um, really almost as powerful as uh, Earl Godwin. And they they worked together. And again, there was the, the, the three of them. So by this stage, really, the leading Earls were always Mercia, um, usually the, the south and then Northumbria. And Leofric, I say, was nowhere near as charismatic as Earl Godwin. And, um, but he was very staid, very steadfast, very rich, very powerful, and um, married to Lady Godiva, obviously. And then his son, Alf, um, uh, sorry, Alfgar, was um, a little bit of a thorn in the side of the Godwinsons. Um, there was a, a sort of a power play between the two families. By 1066, um, various things had happened. Harold Godwinson, it seems to me, really needed the Mercians on side and a marriage was negotiated. We're not sure when it happened, when he married Algith. Um, sometime, I think probably after he became king, but. I'm looking into that a little bit because there's some evidence that it might have happened beforehand. So actually at the point in 1066 where everything went really rather wrong for the English. So Earl Edwin was Earl of Mercia, his brother Morcar was Earl of Northumbria and their sister was married to the king. So they were in a pretty powerful position and um, you know, definitely the king needed them on side. They um, were at the Battle of Pulford um, outside York. Uh, 
it seems that even if they got down to Hastings in time, I don't think they took part in the battle itself. Um, their sister might have had a son, Harold, by King Harold. She apparently, we're told, was got safely away to Chester. We don't really know what happened to her after that. So they, they were pretty powerful. The, the Earls Edwin and Morcar, uh, Morcar ended up fighting with Hereward the Wake um, and was imprisoned. Edwin managed to stay free, um, carried on fighting, even though they both submitted to William, they sort of reneged on their oaths. Um, Edwin was killed supposedly by his own men in 1071. And, and that was the end of the Mercian line and its influence. Wow. Wow. So the Normans come in, they they win the Battle of Hastings, they sweep through England and, and set William up as king. What changed for Mercia as an earldom? And, and what did England start to look like after the Norman conquest? Um, well, it was, it was a mess for a long while um, because initially uh, William was successful. Um, but a lot of people, you know, as I say, even if they'd sworn um, fealty to him, didn't last. And, and there were rebellions, particularly in the north, um, in York. Um, a lot of the areas in, in Mercia as well were rebelling. A sad fact is that all these rebellions, all these uprisings were brutally put down. And, and we have this famous phrase, some people call it the harrowing of the north, some people call it the harrying of the north. Um, it, it was, I, I mean, burnt, basically. Um, people were sort of starved out, burnt out, uh, really put down with a very, very heavy military boot. Um, and things really radically changed because obviously landowners lost their lands. Interestingly, some of the notable women didn't. And it seems like Lady, Lady Godiva, who must have been well into her 80s, I think, by this stage, actually managed to hang on to her lands. Um, don't know how. Um, Queen Edith, um, Edward the Confessor's widow, and obviously sister to um, the Godwins, um, she also um, held on to her lands and seemed to have a, a reasonable working relationship with, with William. But the rest of the English nobility, no, their, their lands were taken. Um, you know, I, the, the women have to assume there are an awful lot of uh, probably forced marriages. Whether that much changed on the ground, you know, if, if you're a peasant working the land for one lord, does it really matter if it suddenly changes and you're working for a different lord? So I, I think it was it was the top layer of society that, that was affected the most, really. Yeah. Yeah. So this might be a little bit of a difficult question uh, for you to answer, but... Are there any Mercian rulers that stand out to you um, specifically? Do you have a favourite Mercian ruler? Um, I think my favourites, there's probably two of them. There's, there's King Pender. I, I love him because I love... He Yes, he was a, an aggressive warlord, but when you look at his actions, a lot of it is defensive as much as it is aggression. I love that he wasn't a hypocrite. A lot of times he seemed to go out to war. He famously uh, chased a West Saxon king uh, literally halfway across the country because this West Saxon king had put aside Pender's sister uh, when he converted and married a Christian. So Pender seems to have disliked this kind of hypocritical, I'm converting, I'll get myself a new wife scenario, which did happen a lot. Uh, so I like his straightforward, I, I like the fact that he, he stayed true to, to himself and his beliefs and his wife, actually, it seems like he just had the one wife and many, many children. Um, so his personal loyalty, I think, shines through. Athelflaed, Lady of the Mercians, of course. Um, others that stand out offer, as I said before, he's not a likeable character, but you have to admire his ambition. And there are other quiet ones at Athelbold who came before offer as just as successful just as much of a warrior king, but kind of gets forgotten. Um, and there was a King Kenwolf who actually reigned for 25 years, uh, very successfully, doesn't kind of get on most people's radar. And uh, Pender's son, Ethelred, as well, who reigned for the best part of 30 years, and again, largely peacefully, 
So there were really successful ones, but yeah, I think my favourites are Penda and Apple Flat. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Present History Podcast. But this was only half our conversation with Annie Whitehead. So check back next week to hear the rest of the fascinating conversation where we talk more about Anglo-Saxon culture, the Vikings, and of course, the Last Kingdom. You don't want to miss that. To find out more about Annie and her work, check out her website, anniewhitheadauthor.co.uk, and you can follow her on Twitter, at Annie W History. All the links will be in the description as well, so never fear. And make sure to follow us on all social media platforms so you can keep up to date with all that we do. And we'll see you next week on the Present History Podcast. <laughs>